Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Rook along with Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors. And the close is Friday, pretty much higher except for the wheat complex. And Sean, uh, corn and soybeans uh, posting some recovery into the end of the week. You've got soybeans closing above the 50% retracement level here today. Do you think we keep going? I don't think we have a lot more room to the upside. I mean, I think the market got a little carried away with the bearish China news last week that the corridor deal is going to stay open and you know, um, geopolitics is going to calm down. But when you when you still sit down and think it through, all crop supplies remain very tight. And when we look at the situation in South America, um, as much as Brazil is good, is as equally as bad as Argentina. So when you put the two together, it's similar overall production, including derivative aggregate supplies. And so that's not necessarily the most bearish picture. It's also not the a massively bullish picture. It's sort of a picture where the price of, of soybeans is probably right, but it means we need a big crop. And when I look at the acreage, Michelle, that the U.S. is contemplating planting from not only the USDA, but from some of my private talks that I'm having with others, I don't think we have enough soybean acres baked in here to make sure we don't get ourselves into trouble should Mother Nature throw us a curveball. I just, I just think we need more acres, especially with this renewable diesel thing coming later this year. And What's going to be needed? I, I just think the market's mispriced what needs to happen here. So I don't disagree with you. We've got to get um, November beans back above at least $14 here, though, before you're going to attract some of those acres back, don't you think? Well, I would just say it's just, you know, if, if, if we assume corn stays where it is, I would agree with you. We're going to need new crop soybeans to get to that $14 level again to have those that can switch that have the ability to switch to consider doing so. Obviously, as you know, Mother Nature plays a, an important role. Do they get off to a slow start in an area or, or a quick start? But certainly, I'd rather be on the safe side and make it pretty economically attractive to plant more soybeans. Uh, I would not leave it up to the Mother Nature to take care of it, given what I think is going to be a, a pretty tight balance sheet if we don't get this, if we don't get this right. So I know you feel like the South American story, the Argentina story is kind of priced in here already in the old crop, but soybean meal is flirting again with contract highs. And if meal pushes back into that level, do soybeans have any choice but to go back up here and try to retest these highs? You know, they've kind of really juiced up the, uh, the nearby bean meal price relative to, let's say, the December price pretty much as high as they can go, or, you know, we're near a record spread between the two, you know, okay. they're pricing in a shortage out of Argentina. So once again, you know, you know, we were up today on meal and, and, and they could push up a little further. But when I look at the demand for feed, you know, the, the amount of animals that are out there, you know, the, the hog numbers and such, I just think we're overpriced on meal. And I don't think, I pretty much think the market is kind of because of that spread being as, as incredibly inverted as it is, Kind of feel we've already priced it in and yeah we can move around a little bit but i don't really think you know meal is going to take out let's say 500 dollars here you know and really rocket higher on argentina news i just don't think that's in the cards so corn's had a retracement as well here some recovery not 50 percent like in the soybeans and we kind of hit 640 as far as resistance today but pretty hard to get over that point here now with the acreage thing you just talked about because the market feels comfortable with acres and our export demand isn't picking up, right? Export demand is really weak. You know, it's obviously too early to say exactly what the new crop, uh, the uh, second crop corn in Brazil is going to look like, but um, you know, they have good moisture. Um, it's, it is delayed, but it looks like, you know, they're going to continue into kind of a wet pattern into their dry season, which means we can expect a pretty good crop. Uh, that's going to start competing with ours before too long. And we just don't have the animal feeding units to, 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 to get the demand to really be there um, with the kind of acres that we're expecting to plant here. I just don't see where the demand's going to come from. Sure, Cordell could take off and maybe we can get the ethanol thing you know, going again. But I just think from a feed demand perspective, which is where most of the uh, demand comes from, it would be very, very difficult to uh, – to prop corn above 640 without something else new coming along. Wheat demand has been pretty horrible as well on the export front. And so that's one of the things that's probably hurt the wheat market. But also we are seeing kind of an improved weather pattern here for HRW areas as well, aren't we? 
Yeah, we're getting to the firing line now, Michelle, where moisture means a lot. Remember, we've had a very, very warm period for Southern Plains and the South, uh, you know, in the uh, soft red winter wheat areas. A lot of that crop has come out of dormancy. We've gotten a lot of growth going. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's moisture is extremely important, and especially for KC wheat, where it's been continued to be dry. Any moisture at all after a year of no moisture does send people into the pits to sell. Um, and, you know, just the mid-range the mid -range models threw some pretty good moisture and snowfall in, uh, you know, into next week. And that's just not going to excite uh, traders to go in and either short cover or, or establish long positions when, when it's such an important time to determine what yield is going to be. Do we hold $8 here in HRW? And what about $7 on SRW? I think for now we're going to hold those levels. Okay. I think there's enough worry elsewhere, whether it's uh, – uh, the, the hot, dry weather in northern India, whether it's the dry weather is developing in central northern China plains, whether it's the dry weather in France against record tight supplies in Europe. I think there's enough non-U.S. related uh, bullish weather scenarios that should keep the market at least supported for now at those critical seven, eight dollar areas on winter wheat. Cotton market. Uh, we've had a little recovery there as well. We're up flirting with the uh, 85 cent mark again, but cotton, it's really still all about uh, demand in China and with their manufacturing data being better than expected this week. Is that kind of the, um, the tailwind that's pushing us along or what is it? Well, we know that our price is essentially set by how much we export to China. I mean, they're the dominant buyer of U.S. cotton. Um, and so we always look at the ratio of the U.S. cotton price relative to the cotton price in China. At the top, when we were on $1.20, $1.25, we were, US, uh, the U.S. was trading at a record uh, premium, suggesting that we were going to lose demand and that we, were that we should enter some kind of a crash market as demand really caved in, which we saw. But now, if you look at the China cotton price taking off and the U.S. cotton price kind of staying low, we're starting to get that ratio back into a favorable level where we think demand from China, exports to China are going to continue to be better and get even better, especially as they get more comfortable with their economic situation. I think that's really the most important driver. Secondarily, of course, how much of the dry land cotton can get planted in Texas? Always, always an area where you could have three or four million acre swing one way or the other, depending on the weather. That obviously needs to be monitored. Right now, it's still very, very dry in the dryland cotton areas. So right now, when push comes to shove, demand, I think, drives cotton higher into the spring. And then we take another look. Okay, we'll keep watching those China economic figures that come out of there because they've been pretty good here on their recovery. Cattle market, uh, we did score new contract highs today in the feeders. And the live cattle futures, we're back higher here and we're being led by the cash again, which is up another dollar this week in the south today at 165. North dressed up about four dollars. Can the futures set back here to any substantial amount if you've got the futures pulling it or the cash market pulling the futures along like this? Well, as long as the cash continues to rip like that, the answer is it really can't do it for too long. It tried to do it yesterday. Yeah. And then came storming back to, and of course, obviously the news out of Brazil about them, you know, not uh, being able to export to China because of their uh, second round of a disease problem. We don't know how long that will last, but we obviously, they're an important supplier of beef to China at a time that they're getting more excited about their economy. So if we lose it there, we're going to get more here at a time where we don't have a lot to give. And so that throws an extra wrench into the equation. And, you know, I've been, I've been feeling that we were due for uh, at least a short-term top and uh, and the market has continued to trend higher on strong cash. And obviously this news out of Brazil, you know, may be a game changer for not allowing for a sustainable decline as they move into the spring at this point. That was, pr I think, a pretty important development unless it were to change quickly and they were, you know, they, they can export quickly again. If it's more of a two to three month affair, very, very hard to think you could knock this cattle market down right now with the cash being as strong as it is. 
So yeah. And as I've argued with you before, we're going to get into <laughs> the tightest numbers here. So yes, we are. I hate to get my bull horns out, but maybe I am. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. Sean Hacka with Hacka Financial Advisors here with Markets Now.